A warm welcome to Mr. Rick Essig here from New York, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. All right. Who here still likes to spin vinyl? Yeah. Very good, Ike. Like to see that. That's, yeah. that's good. I am the last person who can screw up your record. That is true. So actually, when you when you um, you know when you do music, you maybe you know end up getting like a record deal, maybe you know, and uh, he would he could be the man. He could be the man who actually is in charge that your record sounds that it good on the record. All over the place. That's my job. He did stuff like for Radiohead, for um, Justin Timberlake, for Britney Spears, for but the girl. Yeah. The good ones. So. Yes. So so the man, yeah. you know knows how to get this stuff onto, you know, onto the radio and everywhere, that it sounds good. So maybe tell us a little bit like, about, your, about your job. Like, people come with what and what can you do to the people in general? Um, yeah, I've been doing this, I guess, close to man, 18 years. Yeah. Um, about 18 years. <laughs> a little bit less. Um, you know, it, I, I enjoy cutting vinyl. You know, I got into it when people, you know, started saying the death of vinyl is coming. I've only cut more vinyl every year I've been doing it, so it's a, it's a big lie. People love vinyl. Um, I love cutting vinyl. It's a, it's, a, it's a great format. You really get a, a cool sound from vinyl that really doesn't come across well on digital at this point yet. So it is still kind of one of those voodoo craft things that a lot of people really can't do, mainly because of the machinery involved. It's a big freaking lathe. You've got to cut these things on. The material itself is a very specialized type of, of paint, really. It's, it's like a, a car paint on a piece of metal. It's basically what a lacquer master is. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a cool gig. And dance music, guys, DJs, I mean, they're, they've been great. They're like the main source of, of, of business for me in, in my work, which is nice, because I have a nice following of DJs and, and underground subtype labels that really only do vinyl which is nice to have. Would, would you say that, uh, that actually when like uh, dance music, especially uh, techno, you know, in the early 90s, like kind of like took over with all the independent labels, would you say that actually this saved the vinyl for like, you know, extended it? Because I mean, you know, people were like, major productions were not coming out on vinyl anymore from like the beginning of the 90s, people were switching to CDs, but the independent small labels, they would still do vinyls because they want to hand it out to the DJs. Well, yeah, a lot of the house, a lot house, of house and, uh, yeah. and the underground stuff, definitely. So you think like the independent labels like kind of like kept it alive for much longer? Yeah, although it's it's you know the labels always have done twelve inches. It's kind of funny. It, it, there are a lot of them are just promos. Yeah. But they it's amazing. I mean, I do a lot of singles are released like a jewel single will be longer than the freaking album. They got so many goddamn mixes on it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, double vinyl, seventy-eight, ninety minutes of, of remixes for one track. So I mean, they put that stuff out there. So they're the general public doesn't see them. Yeah. So, re so regardless, like, on what, what kind of stuff you bring it out, like, it might be a CD or, you know, you said before, like, cassette, also masterings for cassette you did, and or vinyl, like, you know, what would, like, what would the people bring to you? Like, you know, you, you have a job, you know, yeah. you start up the equipment, like, what would you look at? Like, what's, what's, the, what's the format that people would bring you their, like, finished music and, like, make you go through pain or enjoyment, you know, what's, what's it usually like to well, start with the project? It's getting crazy now because there's so many different formats. People are bringing MP3s, they're bringing, they're bringing waves, they're bringing you know, split stereo files, interleave stereo files, mono files, SD2, SD1, I mean, it's, it's kind of insane, but I always try and just tell people to bring the, the whatever master is closest to what they finish the mix as. as not to keep bouncing it around and, and converting and, and changing things, because it's just, generation loss is a generation loss. They, they say theoretically and digitally you're not going to get it, but things can happen. I've gotten files where they're supposed to be a stereo file, but one of them's like slightly out of phase, because it's like maybe a two frames offset. The guy doesn't know how it happens, so then you got to go in and... So you usually would not hear that when you just listen to it, but you would, you, you would hear it and you would have like, to worry about that. Call when you the guy up. Yeah, exactly. You so go. Tell the people a little bit, like, like what's, what's, the, what's the perfect preparation, you know, before you can do your job? Like, how would you prepare, uh, prepare your master? You, you, you said you like uh, cutting from tape. Yeah, I mean, analog tape, ideally, analog is going to you know, sound good, but 
In certain aspects, I understand it's not possible. Number one, it's not cost effective. Number two, if you're dealing in a wholly digital realm or you're just doing samples and stuff that don't necessarily, I mean, a great record's a great record when it actually sounds like. You can have a great record of just eight-bit samples. Everybody knows how bad those sound, but put together correctly, it's still a good record. Um, that in itself, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do like an upsampled 96K master of that because it's, it's you know, high res, because it's not really high res. It's a high res copy of a low res record. So, you know, it's the simplest thing that you can come up with again after you're done with the mix, whether it be a, a, a CD master, a DAT, eh, you just want to keep it as close to what you've done bef before you give it out. But, you know, any format, we take them all. Did you, did you see, like, um, you said you, you did, you're doing, like, what, 19 years or something like this? Close. Close to 19 years. So um, you obviously, like, started when, before, like, all this, like, bedroom production era of, like, you know, everybody's being able to, like, you know, having, like, a sequencer with plugins right. and everything started. So yeah. would, you, would you see, like, an, an, an increase in the, pr in, the, in the quality of people, you know, of, of the material of people that would send you because the stuff is so around, you know, you can get like a uh, compression plug-in here and things like this. Or was it like better when people like, you know, when it was still like kind of like more down to the analog recording stuff? Or yeah, I mean, the quality-wise, yeah, definitely in the, in the early years when you had a dedicated engineer making a mix of a project, it was of generally better sound quality. So bedroom, pr bedroom production in general are... I think, Suck. well, yeah. no, I just think people that, that get themselves set up aren't necessarily familiar enough with the, the, the tools they're using yeah. and maybe not using them optimally. Yeah. Maybe using too many presets or not really dicking around with the program itself to really see what it's doing, what it's not doing, you know, that type of thing. There's just not, there's a whole step missing these days where people that used to record, like I started out as a mix engineer, but before that I had to watch these old guys do it for years, Tell writing what the hell was going that, on. Like how you, how you came from like the engineer kind of thing into the mastering thing, because that's important, because it's mo mostly the step like we don't even maybe know right. about. You it's, know? Not, it's not there anymore. That's a missing step these days. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 if you're lucky enough to get in a, the door of a good studio, usually you start out slopping toilets, taking out trash, getting coffee, whatever you can do, cleaning up after a session, winding cords, just the lowest of the low bullshit. But that's really how you kind of... First of all, they find out if you're serious about it because you're there about 90 or 100 hours a week. You basically just live there. But that's you also get to see these guys do this stuff and you really get to see how signal path works, what signal path is, what's actually happening to the sounds from either, you know, guitar, vocal, all the way through to the, to the final tape. And it's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on. You really got to, I mean, it's a big juggling act to get a good sound on tape. Um, and that, I mean, that process in and of itself, just learning how to do that, is, you know, I mean, it's, you can't buy that kind of stuff because now they, they really have set up these programs, these mixing programs, such a way that you really, you can get something done, but you may not have, the, maybe a great record, like I said, but it may not sound close to how good it could sound if you were really familiar with the stuff you're using in line. I mean, it's so easy now to have these really pretty, you know, the, 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 the GUIs that these guys put on, like for the Steinbergs and all that stuff that, it actually looks like a piece of analog gear, yeah. but you know, it's, what, is it, what is it really doing? Yeah, but I mean, uh, is it, you, you think it's important that you, when you like, let, let, let's say you, you do the production at home, there is no other way you can do it, you right. know, you have to fight your way through plugins, through like, you may, maybe some gear that you can get some, you know, on your hand. Um, um, how important is it like to, to compare to stuff where you want, like, your stuff, you want, you right. want it sound alike, right. you know, not the same, but alike, like, how, how important is it actually to listen to your stuff on your speakers at home? Yeah, it's to very get important. To know, yes? Yeah, a lot of times I get, you know, new clients especially will say, here's my record, here's this Dr. Dre record, make my record sound like this record. I'm like, well, I mean, sure, not going to happen. Um, Dre has the people around him that know how to put a record together. That's why his records sound like that. Um, so it's, again, the step which is missing in the most. But if people were, you know, if, I mean, if that's really your goal and you have, this is your system in your house, put the Dre record up, how does the Dre record sound in your system, then try and make your mix sound as close to that as possible. You may have a crappy system at home, but the whole comparative thing is, is what you can really get your ears tuned into if you have a specific sound in mind that you want to 
get. I mean, you may not have a sub, so you don't know what you're, what's happening on your, on your subsonic level. You're just cranking that low end until those little babies are flapping around. And you're going, all right, that looks like enough low end. But then when you actually get it onto a record, it's like, oh, holy mackerel, way too much. So it's really it's just, again, familiarizing yourself with what you have. I mean, people can, I've heard the worst records in the world come out of, you know, the hit factory, booked out for $50,000 a day. It just, it's just, oh, it's horrifying. Again, I've heard great records come out of people's basements. So again, it's, it's, it's more the, it's more the, um, the individual. Yeah, and it's, more, it's, it's, it's not only the gear that you have. You can go out and buy all the gear, but if you don't have the experience... If you don't know what you're doing with it, it's just a waste of money. So um, when, when, you know, people do it anyway at home, you know, like fiddle around with, like, sure. compression, plugins, de-essing, you L know... L1. All, the, all that stuff. Ultra maximizer. <laughs> Ultra maximizing their, 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 their stuff. So, evil, um, evil tools. So is it, like, does it make, does it, make it harder, actually, for Extremely a mastering difficult. guy? yeah. Just to to uh, if people like take too much life out of their stuff or whatever. Exactly. What would you t suggest? Like you have like never let's say put two track compression on a mix. If you, if you just make it sound as good as you can and then let the let the other guy do it because that way if there are really any problems that need to be fixed in the mix you need something brought up or something brought down. It's when you have the headroom to do that it's much easier. It sounds much better. I mean you know it's almost like people hey I finally got it to be a square wave now it rocks. Farthest from the truth. Um, you know, it's, it's, I mean, whenever they ask me, I say, just don't put it through anything at the end. Don't worry about how loud it is. That's the, the, the last thing you should be worrying about. But the loudness, like, to a lot of people, the loudness is really important. Like, the record so might sound good. Like, you put the CD in, it sounds good, but you have to bring it up, like, three or four notches. So it would sound the same as a, let's say, Right, Maria Carey record or whatever, because they used like you know. Well, we so do that, but we do that after we process the tracks. So you like so it's you. It's my would, job to make you, it loud. Yeah, so you would go like from you know the dream thing. You would go down. You said to the to the limitations of the of the of the format. Well, you have to. Yeah, I mean, like ulti ultimately, you're delivering a 16-bit, yeah. 44-1 CD master. Yeah. Unless you go SACD or you know. Yeah. I mean, you can go to that one-bit thing, but that's. You know, and actually, you would worry about the loudness afterwards. So if that's people right. In other words, I process the track, EQ it, compress it, whatever I got to do to it, and then right before I dump it into the workstation to edit it up, I'll, I'll put what needs to be put on it to, to punch up the volume. But what is the, if, if the peaks stand out and the volume is gone, but you did pro compression before, so you make sure that it's a nice, flat, kind of like... No, I mean, it's, again, the whole visual thing is that it's... Basically, what I do is I, again, VU meters, which are, you know a lot of people don't use these days. But as far as a VU reading of peak peak modulation on a record would be zero VU plus or minus whatever level you put on the record. So you can have a record that's say plus five over what the peak yeah. of the record would be. So to transfer that over to CD thing, you say I say basically my limit will be I will add about eight dB of gain until I get plus eight over zero for a CD. That's basically as far as I'll push it, and that's the competitive line. People tend to, a few people go over it, but you can, I mean, it's just horrifying to listen to it. You yeah, because if you do it, it with software, fatiguing. software would give you like a red, a, well, a red just, line there, yeah, you know. Well, see, that's the thing. I mean, the tools we have are specifically designed just to do that. But again, I mean, how many records are out there now that you cannot sit through the whole thing because you just, it does something to you. You get fatigued. It's just annoying to sit through 74 minutes of music because it's just like grinding into your teeth. And, yeah. Yo. Yeah, uh, I don't mean to, to jump right into uh, sure, go ahead. skills oh, go ahead. or anything. I'm through rambling. Okay, jump so, in. Okay, so let's say that um, we can't afford uh, giving our stuff to someone like you, and mm -hmm. we're not going to be like paying Clear Channel to play right. it, so, um, or paying you for that right. matter, no disrespect. But, no, sure. uh, so then would it be uh, in our interest to use the L1 Ultra Maximizer? Sure. You know? I mean, if, I mean, if, if you've you got to do what you've got to do. If you're going to deliver directly to a plant to make your own stuff, then yeah, but, but if you know you're going to be using somebody in, in between, don't do it. So do you have any suggestions about how people who maybe just have the Cracked Wave pl plugins? Well, <laughs> see, it's tough because the way I do it, again, is I mean, I'm working through an entire analog console, so I'm dropping input level to certain devices. So I'm not overloading things along the way, and it's like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, a little bit there, until the final thing is what it is. So that you may not have the luxury of that you just pop, you're pumping it right through the the chain. So so wait you you mean that you're 
going along with the EQ and dropping certain frequencies. Well, like you have the input level of the console. So like if I get okay. a mix from somebody and it's already screaming hot, I'm dropping the input level of the console by 10 dB to start out. Okay. So it's and then I'm no rebuilding it again from there to try and fix whatever problems are going on. And then at the very end of it, unfortunately, if I have to re-add some gain back. So if like your master, like the master I would send you is like terribly loud because I'm embarrassed sending you a quiet master, actually you take it down anyway. Oh yeah, you have to. I mean, so so do you, do you go like through the track, would you like subtract what you don't have and let it stand out what you want to have or would you add to it? Um, well, it depends. I mean, there's some things you want to cut, some things you might want to add. I, I'm, not, I'm not one of the engineers that always has to be adding. Sometimes taking away is, is a better deal. A lot of times people have way too much screaming, like 14K, so I'll just I'll roll that right off the bat. I'm not going to bring the bass up to try and fight with it. You know, it's that whole just checks and balance thing. You just, after so many years, you build up kind of a card file of what things sound good, and then you kind of just reference that. In, I mean, I reference that in my head to what I'm working with. I'm like, all right, this is this type of music. I, I, I think it seems, it seems to need this. Um, you, you were so saying the bass. I mean, you know, we were talking about a lot, like in the studio, about compression and stuff like this. And obviously, the the the, the most hard, the hardest thing to get right for most of the people, also for me, like for I think for everybody, is like to get the bass right. Like the bass is the hardest frequency. Yeah, it's either like. fighting with the kick or it's fighting with the yeah. So, like you said before, when we talked a little bit, uh, you don't even use a, a, a sub in the studio. You like you don't believe in sub. Can you explain, like you know, like what? Well, I don't because my studio is set up in such a way that I have giant speakers that have adequate low end. I mean, I, I'm not against it in an environment where you have absolutely none. I mean, you've got to hear something. But I think people tend to fool themselves with a sub. Or it's, you know, or it's not set up right. I mean, again, if you really want to get accurate, you have to really tune what you're listening to to be as, not necessarily flat, but as accurate as it can be for what you hear. So because everybody a lot of people different. are afraid that they record in a club then where they have actually a substanding might sound like screaming and mid-range because they didn't put, uh, you know, not, not enough sub in. Like, but for, for, the, for the mastering purpose, you can like try to create a mix that would work in the club as well as on a radio, on a kitchen, on a little kitchen radio. Yeah, and see, that's, a, that's kind of a myth too because generally... Yeah, maybe it, you explain a little bit the radio as myth. Long as it, yeah, as long as it's done right, it's going to sound good anywhere. You don't really have to say, all right, this is going to be the radio mix. Because the radio guys beat the crap out of your record anyway. It's pretty much dead when, once it hits the airwaves. So, it, it, oh, 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 horribly. Because they have to fit that, all that crap in one little bandwidth of airwaves. So it's the whole FCC thing where they got it. Plus, they want it to be screaming loud. So if you, really, if you, if you, try, to, if you try to do that with a mix, you'll hear that it'll, you know, I mean, it'll, it'll be super harsh. People think, well, I've got to make it brighter. I've got to have less low end for the radio. That was, I think, maybe true in the 40s, but not now. So when you, when you, when you like, let's say you finish, yeah, we come to you in a sec. When you, when you finish the track at home, you know, you made it as good as possible on your Mackie mixer or wherever, you know. Um, I always go, like, and listen to it and, like, diff on different yeah, speakers the car, in the car. Sure. Like, on different sizes of speakers as well. As well. And you should, at, at that point, it should relatively sound the same. I mean, obviously there are going to be differences, but there shouldn't be huge differences. If there is, then there's some, some issues in there. It's not, it's not because, oh, the boombox is boomy. It's because something in the mix is making the boombox boomy. Yeah. Monica. Um, this is going to be a weird question, but basically w what you do is like the same thing as like may say be, may maybe say like what Ron Murphy does. Who's Ron Murphy? Like, um, Okay, so you cut the records right there in your yeah, studio? Yeah, I have, I have a lathe in my studio, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and do you mostly, use, so all your stuff is analog? All my, well, my console is, but I use a digital workstation as well. But okay. I only use that basically as a tape machine. So I use that for editing purposes and for assembling a master for CD if it need be. Or a lot of times now people will deliver a record on either three different sources or out of sequence. So I have to dump it in and sequence it, you know, before I cut it. Okay, and the best type of a file to, to give you would be a stereo file? If, you, if you're going to use, yeah, if you're going to use like Pro Tools files, yeah, keep, keep them linked because once they're separate and you're, they're floating around somewhere, I mean, not just me, but you know, you may, suppose you find a guy who's charging whatever, 50 bucks an hour to get your CD done. Don't, don't leave anything to chance because you may end up with a 
CD that's all effed up. Because that's, I mean, it's real easy to slip those. Because people, like, I have, to, I have to load the SD files directly onto my Sonic Solution system, which now doesn't, it doesn't interpret it like, like uh, Sound Designer does. So I'm basically just now stuck with two single files, left and right, that now I've got to align time-wise. So if you've got a guy who's not really hip on doing that right, you could have some problems. So um, if you've got, you got an interleave stereo file, they, they can't screw it up. So um, what's, what's the most common, let's call it, mistake that you would run in when people turn in mixes? If it's, if it's coming from a big studio, from like, you know, major production studio, or just from somebody who did it at home. Can Looks, you pin, yeah, like, well, pin it down on like, you know, the usual sure. mistakes that people do? Not only like mechanical force onto the medium, but also like when people do, do, like, do, like, you know, do their mix, let's say there's like vocals in it, and there's like a guitar in it, and stuff like this. Is it like that um, there's like the usual mistake that people make, like putting up the vocals too high, or like adding up too many highs, or stuff like this? I mean, because... Again, I don't know, because you know, people like different things. I have clients that just... I couldn't listen to what they want me to do. It would drive me insane, but it's the client's the client. I'm a service guy. So some guys want it super stupid bright. Other guys like a lot of low end. They don't like it so bright. I mean, it's just, it's always a personal taste. I can't really, I mean, I, obviously if they're glaring mistakes, I can say, you know, dude, there's a problem here. We might be able to fix it, but, you know. But some people just like a, a vocal way, way the hell out there. But you basically work off a stereo file, so people would not come, like, with, say, like, eight, eight, like kind of like eight files and you would do like a kind of like I have done it but it's I, I make sure I make it cost prohibitive so they don't uh, it's they don't come too often no, okay it's much more expensive yeah I don't like doing that I've had to do it I've had to actually I, I did the uh, the last well, I don't know it was the last one. it was a compilation of delight stuff but I did with Dimitri yeah. and Dimitri hadn't finished mixing so we actually rented gear and he was mixing this record during the mastering session. In, so, your, in your place. Yeah, yeah, which was just stupid money. I mean, I was like, if we got to do it. Because I mean, I just, me, I like to, you know, I guess I have ADD or something, because I can't spend that much time on a fucking song. It's got to be, I mean, I, you know, I, I work and I, you know, that's it. Let's do it, let's move on. So to sit there, I even mean, it's, just, it's just torture. Um, can you describe a bit uh, about the process of uh, mastering? Because uh, like for me and for a lot of people, they don't really know what's uh, the difference between engineering and mastering. And where would it go? Like, like where would the signal go? Well, basically, no. it's you know, well, first of all, it's really just having, hopefully, somebody you trust as that last set of ears to listen to it and, and make an objective changes on your record. Because basically, everybody knows. I mean, you can't. You really, you're so close to your own record. It's tough to really make informative decisions on what, what may not sound right. You know, it's just, you live with it so long. It's, so I'm kind of like that extra, that extra trusted set of ears to say, all right, you know what, we could probably fix it a little bit by doing this, a little bit of that. Um, it's kind of weird. I mean, it's like, it's, unless you're actually putting vinyl out, it's not a super necessary step, yet, you know, it's, a lot of people think they need it, obviously. And uh, I think it helps. I mean, I, it, it, it just, it, they're, they're giving it over, and it's like, all right, now, now do what you think needs to be done to really make this thing shine. Just that last bit of spit and polish. Like, you can describe maybe a specific, like, like the radio uh, album, or like, what did you do? What did they bring you, and what did you, what was the process that you did? Well, basically, I'll put a track up, like, um, Say a little Kim record comes in or Jay Z record, and you have it's 12 inch, so you have three different remixers doing a, a remix of the same track. So the three different guys have been in three different places. So initially, you listen to all three and you say, All right, there's got to be a certain amount of continuity here. So since these guys weren't talking to each other, there's probably not going to be that. So the first step is to say, All right, what do I need to do to bring these a little bit closer together? In, in more of a, a flow type thing. So again, you know, one track may be ultra maximized, one may not. One may have super stupid low end, and one may have nothing. So you gotta look at that, and again, it's like you kinda reference what you have in your head as, for whatever I'm listening to, this is how, what sounds the best. And then you try and adjust that to come up to what 
that reference point is. And that's basically just, you know, EQs and, and compressors and, and just the basic, the basic stuff. So you do, you, you, you do use uh, compressors on the overall track? Yeah. Good ones, though, then? Yeah. Yeah. So basically, the chain would be you go through a couple of EQs to make it like to come I actually, out. No, I actually compressed the four EQ. Yeah. Only because it tends to, if you do it afterwards, you'll tend to get more pumping because you're already, now you're compressing an EQ'd signal. I think it's easier to compress a flat signal if it needs it. And then you're dealing, number one, you may not need to add as much EQ because now you're, you're hearing more of what's missing in the track to yeah. begin with. So it's, it's my preference. Some guys do it after, I do it before. I've done it after. Now I do it before, so I see. maybe next year I'll change. I don't know. Yeah, um, has there Parker. ever been? A, yeah, has there ever been a time where, like, let's say, a hip hop artist or any artist has bring like their music unmixed and they're just like just master it? And could you please share an experience um, of like something that you brought to life? You felt like, well, you know, it's it's unmixed, and uh, you know, I have to do something with it. So. Well, no. it's never been, what do you mean by unmixed? I mean, it's, it's always going to be in, in a two-track form. It's going to be... Okay, yeah, two-track stereo. All right, basically. yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, that's what I meant. Oh, yeah, all the time. I mean, that's, a lot of my clients, that's why I have them, because they're like, all right, do what you got to do. Do that, do that thing you do. Um, <laughs> could so you they, wouldn't, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't come with, like, suggestions. They would more, like, trust on your... On yeah, your, most yeah. of my guys don't even come for sessions anymore. They'll just mail it in, because they... The deal with the mastering is, is, you know, if you come into a studio, you don't know, you really don't know even what you're hearing. So I know what I'm hearing because I'm in that room every day. So, you know, once the guys get used to what you're doing, they'd rather not even show up because you're just sitting on a couch for eight hours can get pretty, pretty tiring. And you play the same, you know, Sega golf game over and over, it's, it gets old. So, but, uh, the, you know, they, 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 like I said, it's the same principle as that 12-inch thing. They come in, basically the mixers are probably all over the place, the tracks themselves. What does exactly the equipment that you have does, and how do you do it? I have a mass select transfer console, which is basically where it's a three-piece unit. The one, it's all AES, EBU, and analog inputs. Actually, it's not AES, it's all analog. Um, all my inputs and outputs from my converters and my analog gear go into the back of that. The input from whatever source I'm coming from, whether it be tape or whatever plugs into that, it goes through, it's, the console itself is broken up in a bunch of different sections. You have an input section, you have uh, insert section, you have output section, which has different um, filters, it has a width control, it has all these neat little gizmos and the analog thing. Then from there I have it going into a uh, mass select compressor, into a Sontech mastering EQ, into another Sontech uh, split left right parametric EQ. Then it goes into another DSer, an analog peak limiter, which I pretty much only use for cutting the vinyl. I have used it on some CDs though. Then it goes back into the converters to convert to digital, and then whatever nonsense I got to put on it to make it loud goes goes in there. I have an L2. Everybody's got an L2. Okay, we got something from our man P Nice here. This record is out, right? All for free? <laughs> okay. So you did some mastering on it or it's just... Yeah, yeah, I did. I, this is something that I did. Um, I did a lot of mixing on. And then at the very end, I, I did like uh, EQ to bring up, I think, the high a little bit and L2 or L1. Um, just because I wanted... Ultra-maximizer. Right, right, exactly. Cause just because I knew I was going to be handing it out and I didn't, I wanted, since I knew I wasn't going to give it to someone right. to master it, this is just like a, a demo for me to give out to people. I, want, I didn't want to have them have to like crank right, up crank it on the, the system, up. you know, so... You know, a big problem with that too is these goddamn multi-disc players. That really is what fucked everybody up because they could just put five in or ten in and then they really started going, oh, now I got to yeah. get to turn the thing up and I go, eh, eh. Back in the days when you just had to put one in at a time, you were already yeah, up there. Yeah, because like you were saying, 45s and 33s, you had to turn it up anyways. Yep. Nobody wants to get up off the couch. All right. Then you'd have more standout. It's kind of, it's kind of boofy. That technical term, boofy. Yeah. yeah, a lot of times subtracting works a lot better than adding to cover up stuff. That's what I would do with that. I mean, the pianos, it's like that 8 to... to that 600 to 1,000 hertz. So you think the pianos 
are a little bit too loud. Lower, yeah, yeah, it's not and loud. It's not that it's too loud, too but it's, it's yeah. no, it's something in the lower lower range of the keys. It's okay. that's you know that's like in that low out. mids thing. Right. They need to be, I think, more tinkly. Okay. Less. You know what I mean? Yeah. 